Okay, so. Oh, no, I am. I can hear myself. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, but yesterday it just struck me in, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to start with a joke. <laughs> now, this is an old joke. So you've probably heard this joke before, but that's okay because it just fits. Golfing with Moses, Jesus, and the old man. So one day in heaven, Moses and Jesus are playing around a golf. Did you know that you could play golf in heaven? <laughs> um, when an old man came up and asked if he could join them, they said, sure. So Moses is up first. And he hits a duck hook, and that went immediately toward the water. The waters part, the ball rolls on dry land, up onto the green. Jesus is next. Jesus hits his ball toward the water also. But instead of parting, the ball hovered over the water and it goes onto the green six feet from the hole. The old man asked himself, how am I ever going to top these two guys? He took a swing and he severely sliced the ball to the right, hit a tree, bounced along the shore next to the water before running away. Oh, no, wait. So bounced the shore next to the water. It comes to a stop. A squirrel picks it up, runs off with it. Uh, an owl comes by, picks up the squirrel, and the squirrel drops the ball on the green and it bounces right into the hole. <laughs> Just go in one. Jesus comes over to the old man, looks at him for a moment, says, Good shot, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so life is an adventure. And we have the, the opportunity to live it from a consciousness of excited anticipation or from a consciousness of concern. An adventure is defined as an exciting or very unusual experience. Participating in exciting undertakings or enterprises, the spirit of adventure it's a bold, usually risky undertaking. Hazardous action of uncertain outcome. To embark on an adventure, you must be willing to let go of the journey and the outcome. Over the course of the past few weeks, we've been exploring a book called Finding Yourself in Transition by Robert Grumman. And in this book, he talks about, about transition, and, and we all go through transitions all the time. Another word for transition is change. So he says that there are three stages that we go through when we go through a transition. We go through the ending, the void, and the beginning. All true transitions start with an ending. Something comes to an end in order for us to enter into a new beginning. So in the first week, we talked, in the first couple of weeks, we talked about that ending <clears throat> and talked about that we have to let go. We have to let go of what is in order to step into the void. And in stepping into the void, the void is that place of uncertainty. So when someone talks to me about the, says the word void to me, it's like, it feels like nothingness. That's a feeling that kind of comes up for me. It's like, oh, there's nothing. There's nothing there. But actually, that is never true. Because in the universe, even if it's in the void, that there is infinite possibility. 
those unlimited possibilities that we talk about when we say the mission statement every week. We talk about the unlimited, um, you know, expressing the unlimited possibilities of spirit. And, and that comes out of the void. It comes out of that emptiness. A, a, a seed has to remove the husk in order for the seed to sprout. A, a creature has to, has to um, create a chrysalis and be in a chrysalis before it gains wings and can fly. And so it's really about being in that place and it's a natural place for us to be. But in the West, we don't talk about that, that empty place. In Eastern philosophy, they talk about it much more than, than we do in the West. In the West, our reaction to an ending is fill it up, fill it up. You know, it's kind of like a gas tank. Oh, it's getting empty, fill it up. Fill, fill, you know, any space that we see that is empty, it's like, I've got to put something in that. And, and so we're entering into a process as a community and really we're invited on a personal level to enter into this process also, um, really stepping into that place, into that void and, and discovering who we are, why we are here and how do we express that? What are the ways that we want to express who we are? One of the major teachings about being in the void is really getting in touch with the truth. There is no one and nothing against me. There is no one and nothing against me. And when we live from that place, when we live from a place of there's no one and nothing against me, then we open ourselves up to this, this possibility that we can um, see people in their holiness. We talk about that all the time. We talk about beholding the Christ in someone. Or I behold the Christ in you. What does that mean? It means I'm looking beyond the appearance of what of, 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 of that personality self to a deeper self within that is the truth of who we are. And when we look at people from that place, we can really live in a place where there's no one and nothing against me. What would your life look like if you really believe that there was no one and nothing against you? That driver that cut you off, guess what? It didn't have anything to do with you. Nothing. And even if somebody thinks that they're directing something at you, it doesn't have anything to do with you. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't look at our stuff and that we don't, you know, that we don't have healing work that we need to do. We absolutely have healing work that we need to do. But it's not, we don't do the healing work because somebody is against us. We do the healing work because it's that natural thing that comes up out that wants to express through us. Transition is a time of ripe opportunities. How we look at these opportunities is completely up to us. So, old Buddhist story of a farmer who had a son. And the son goes out one day, and when he comes back, he has this beautiful horse with him. It's a wild horse, and it's, it's this beautiful horse. And all the neighbors come over, and they're like, boy, you are so lucky. You have this brave and, and, and talented son that, you know, courageous son that went out and got this horse. Horse. And now look, you have a horse 
you are so prosperous. And, and the universe is you know, on your side, kind of thing. And the farmer says, we'll see. Well, then the son is trying to tame the horse and he gets left off the horse and he breaks his leg. And everybody comes over and, oh, they're just so, I'm so sorry. Oh, this is so bad. This is so bad that this happened, that your son has broken his leg. How is he, you know, he can't help you with the farm work now. Oh, this is so bad. The farmer says, we'll see. Well, then the army comes through because they're going to go to war. And so they're gathering up all the young men in the town. Oh, except the farmer's son, because he has a broken leg. And everybody comes over to the farmer and says, wow, you are so lucky. Your son didn't have to go to war. So because of his broken leg, so you are so lucky. The farmer says, we'll see. The farmer stays in the present moment. And he doesn't get carried away with, this is good, this is bad. Good, bad, bad, good, good, bad, bad. Oh, good, good, bad, bad. <laughs> the parable teaches us to stay in the present and to not get attached to what we think is happening. And this is a very important piece during the transition because don't we kind of get caught up in what we think is happening and our mind makes up a story. Our mind makes up a story about what it is that's happening before we know what's really happening. The universe is unfolding in divine order that is beyond what the conscious mind is aware of. So it's beyond what our conscious thinking is aware of. Our soul is in complete knowledge of what's going on. And that there is a bigger picture. But we can get caught up in that narrow people view. So there are steps that we can take to assist us in the void. So it's not like, okay, we're just going to be in the void. <laughs> like, like it's ominous and heavy and, oh, we're going to be in the void. There are steps that we can take to assist us through the void. A daily practice of prayer and meditation. Opening ourselves to the divine and listening. Listening to that inner voice within us, that inner voice that is ever guiding us and, and directing us in the way that we are to go, the things that we are to do. Forgiveness work is primary when we're in the void because it's still about letting go. In the void, we're still in the process of truly letting go and going through that transformation. It's like being in the chrysalis. You have to release all those things that are unlike the heaven, the new beginning that we want to step into. And so it's about releasing all that is unlike what we want to become. Self-care is primary also. These are just really basic primary things. But so often what happens when, when, what do we do when we're stressed? You know, it's like, oh, well, maybe we watch too much television or maybe we, we eat too much, we, you know, eat, <laughs> drink, you know, um, other things that we do that are distractions, anything to distract us, but it doesn't, but it's not good for our, our bodies. Maybe it's engaging in a lot of negative thinking and it's not good for our mind. So, so self-care is something that we really want to engage in 
getting plenty of rest, eating well, exercising, those types of things. Now, this one might surprise you. Try new things. This is an adventure. And you can't have an adventure if you're just, you know, sitting there and, and going, well, I used to do that, but that was in the past and that no longer fits. Well, you got to try new things. So, so it's in this time in the void that we try new things. We try on new things. And some things we'll try and we'll go, wow, I really like this. This is great. Other things we might try and go, yeah, that's not for me. But you know what? If you don't try it, you don't know. You just don't know. And just because it's uncomfortable the first time you do it, doesn't mean it's not for you. Sometimes you have to do it over and over again. And, and as you do it over and over again, you become more comfortable. And it's about trying new things. Try something that you've never done before. But maybe it's something that, hmm, way back there in your memory, you thought maybe you might like to try. So let's check in with our Israelite friends. Because in the book, um, Reverend Grummet uses the story of the Israelites and the Exodus from Egypt. And they are in the wilderness or in the void. So there are actually three leaders that lead the Israelites out of Egypt. There's Moses, there's Aaron, and there's Miriam. So Moses represents, each of them bring a gift, and Moses represents manna. Now, manna is the food from heaven that sustained the Israelites as they were in the wilderness. And so Moses, the Moses in us represents that inner food that sustains us as we, um, and nourishes us as as we are in the, as we are in our own personal void. Aaron, who was the priest, represents the cloud that covered the ark. And I thought this was interesting that he represents the cloud that covers the ark. Because the cloud that covered the ark, so the ark the way that the Israelites moved through the wilderness was they had the Ark of the Covenant. And when the cloud raised up above the Ark, then they would take down their tents and get ready and the cloud would move and they would follow the cloud. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. When the cloud went, they went. And so they followed the cloud. So this cloud represents within us that inner guidance that we have, that inner guidance system that tells us when to go and when to stop, when to be active, when to rest. And so it's this this cloud that is this that represents this inner this inner guidance system that we have. You know, we have GPS systems in our car. When we don't know how to get someplace, we just actually it's now it's in our phone. Um, you know, we just, okay, Siri, take me to. <laughs> and all of a sudden we're getting directions to where we want to go. But we have that inner inner GPS within us. And we can ask that inner GPS about when to go, when to stop. Miriam, the midrash of Miriam um, is, is, is an interesting, a midrash is a, 
is a Jewish story. Um, it's a way of interpreting a story. And Miriam, who was both, so Aaron and Moses are brothers, and Miriam is their sister. And Miriam represents the well, as in getting water. And the midrash around Miriam is that whenever Miriam, wherever Miriam was, the well was, and that's how they had water in the wilderness. And I love that. I, I just, I love that story. It's about, it's about wherever she was, you know, and she was with them. And apparently what it did was, it was a, a rock that flowed water to all 12 tribes, to the tents of all the 12 tribes. And water represents that, that cleansing, um, that nourishing, sustaining life because no life can exist without water. And so, and, and it's, it's that ritual cleansing also. There's a ritual cleansing with water. So we have access to these gifts. And instead of being outside of us in physical form, we don't have a cloud that hovers over our head that raises up when it's time for us to move and moves in front of us. Although I do have to say that it, there was a point in my life when people did say that I had a cloud over my head. <laughs> um, I was accused of having a cloud over my head. Um, but it's, it's not about having the physical, it's about really seeing that these are inner qualities within us. There are qualities within us that can that help us to, to go through this adventure that we call life. So one of the um, challenges comes when we forget and we all, all, I don't care who you are, if you're still on the planet, there's a reason you're on the planet. So we all at some points forget. We forget the truth of who we are. We forget the truth of why we are here. So what does it look like when we forget? So this is what it looked like for the Israelites. After two and a half months in the desert, which I'm sure they thought was plenty, because they were murmuring once again. Oh, that there. I love that word. They were murmuring. <laughs> against Moses and against God. Well, they come to Mount Horeb. And if you remember in the first week, I talked about Mount Horeb as being the mountain where the burning bush was. And God said, you will worship me on this mountain. And so Moses climbs the mountain. He leaves the Israelites down below and he climbs the mountain. And he's gone for three days. Well, you know, just leave children alone for three days. Mm -hmm. A lot can happen in three days. <laughs> And what happens with the Israelites in three days is that they gather together all of their precious metals and um, jewels and they melt them down and create a golden calf. <coughs> and they're going to worship the golden calf because at least they can, they can see it and they're doing something. At least they're doing something. They're not just sitting at the base of the mountain waiting for Moses, who He's not coming back. Maybe that's part of the murmur. Mm -hmm. Ooh, he's, do you think he's coming back? Or maybe he's not coming back. So Moses does come back. And let's just say Moses is unhappy. 
he melts down, he melts down the golden calf. And he actually came down with tablets and he threw them on the ground and they splintered everywhere. And, and he melts down the calf and the people repent. Oh, we're so sorry. Yes. Yes, we recognize it. You know, we we forgot. You weren't here to tell us, and we forgot. And so it's about really keeping in touch with the, that Moses that is within us. And keeping in touch with that Christ consciousness that is within us. So that when we tap into that Christ consciousness that is within us, we don't forget. We don't forget really, that we are living expressions of the divine. Living expressions. So I'd like to ask a question of you. Do you have any gold calves in your life? <laughs> Any golden calves? I know I have had golden calves in my life. <laughs> Jobs, relationships, items that I just didn't think I could live without. All of these things in and of themselves are not bad. It's my need to have them look a certain way and be a certain way is that 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 needing to control it and need and looking at it as it is gonna make me okay so the question is do we have anything in our lives that we think that we need in order for us to be Okay, to be lovable, to be, to be whole. And in the void is when we have the opportunity to look at those things and ask ourselves if we're willing to release them. And you know what? Some of them we may not be ready to release yet. And there's no judgment about that. There's no judgment about that. Because when we are ready on a soul level and, and on a wholeness level, when we are ready to release something, we won't be able to hold on to it. We will not be able to hold on to it. So it'll be like, so if it's that job that, that you think, oh, I just I can't live without my job. You know, it brings in my money. It, 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 it gives me satisfaction. Um, it gives me a sense of importance. It builds my self-esteem. It, whatever, you know, I can't live without this job. And then the job is gonna go away. You get fired or laid off. It's like, who am I? Who am I? It's that opportunity to look at who we are. But again, I'm going to say that it's not about digging up and trying to find things within us. Oh, well, I need to, I need to figure out where my golden calves are. Let's see if I can go, go digging. I don't believe in digging into the subconscious mind and trying to find trying to find things that are wrong with us. Okay. <laughs> because I don't know about you guys, but my mind is all too eager to tell me what I need to work on. <laughs> I don't need to go digging for it. And so so it's about not digging, but allowing spirit to reveal. Because what spirit will reveal. Spirit will heal. Spirit does not reveal without healing. And so we just participate and allow the healing to take place.
So being in the void, being in the void is, is an opportunity. And there's two ways that we can look at the void. We can look at the void as a time of adventure, which is a time of, I mean, if you think about a time that you were gonna go on an adventure, maybe take a trip or something that you had never done before, there's this, an element of excitement there. Maybe a little trepidation, but there's an element of excitement there. And we can enter into this time we can be in this time of change with that element of excitement. I wonder what God has in store for us in this, in this time. So let's take that into meditation. Let's just center ourselves in that sacred place within and that, that heart-centered place. That place within us where we know the presence of God right here, right now. Within us, all around us, and greater than us. Allness, the isness. And yet, more personal than anything, any form. Just allow ourselves to be in this presence in this moment. We may want to engage You may want to engage the presence by saying yes. I am willing to be on this adventure. This adventure of life. Yes, I am willing to engage in the processes that are mine to engage in. Yes, I am willing I'm willing to follow my inner guidance. I'm willing to trust my inner spirit. Knowing that it leads me into new beginnings. In this moment, I just say thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for this opportunity to, to engage in this adventure. Thank you, God, that I have loving people that are around me to engage in this adventure with. To share this adventure. Thank you, God, for all the gifts that I receive and all that I am able to give as I walk through and into a new beginning. And so it is.